Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us. There we go. Okay, so thanks for joining us. My name is Daryl. I'll be your moderator today. And our webinar is titled Marketing to Health and Wellness Consumers in 2017. A few housekeeping items before we get started. First of all, all attendees will be on mute. However, we do encourage you to ask questions via your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, the same goes for any technical audio-visual difficulties. If you're experiencing any of these technical problems, please uh, notify us right away via the question, uh, your GoToWebinar control panel, and uh, we will address those as soon as we can. And uh, with that, I'm going to introduce our presenter, Rochelle Bayless, and uh, she's going to take over. So uh, here you go, Rochelle. Thanks, Daryl. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rochelle Bayless, and I'm going to be presenting today on marketing to health and wellness consumers as well as um, fitness consumers. And we're going to be looking at some of the trends, attitudes, and behaviors of people who are health conscious and how this movement's really affecting search and online and offline behavior. So I am I'm the Global Director of Content at Hitwise, uh, where I manage content creation and strategy for our US, UK, and Australian markets. Um, I've written a, reports on a variety of different industries, including retail, travel, news and media, food and beverage, technology, finance, auto, and more. And my research and writing have been published in places like Forbes, Ad Age, and Internet Retailer. But basically, all you need to know about me is that I love telling stories with data, and this is right in the sweet spot of things that I love to talk about and do. So before we get started, I do have an obligatory spiel about Hitwise and who we are and what we do. We've been around for the past 20 years, and our focus is really helping brands and marketers understand the competitive landscape through our unique depths of online consumer insights and audience data. Our online behavioral panel consists of over 8 million individuals. And our activity data is tracked on over 20 million websites across 500 million monthly search queries. And as if that wasn't enough numbers for you, our data includes over 100 million in-market shoppers, and we offer insights across 650 million devices. So we recently released Audience View, which is a tool that I used quite a bit to make the presentation you'll see today. Um, and it allows you to not only get an understanding of how traffic moves between different websites and industries, but even more importantly, Audience View helps marketers look at who the audiences are behind the traffic. And by that, I mean who they are demographically, where they go, and what they really care about. So that's a lot of the kind of data that I'll be looking at today. So just to set the scene, um, healthy living in itself is a multi-billion dollar industry that's growing and permeating across many different verticals. Uh, according to the USDA, the market for organic products and food has surpassed $39 billion in the U.S. Meanwhile, the fitness club industry exceeds $30 billion in revenue, according to IBIS World. And Morgan Stanley reports that sports apparel sales have increased 42% in the last seven years, up to $270 billion. Now, it's worth noting, however, that much of the apparel industry growth that we see is actually due to active wear sales. And as a whole, many major apparel brands are actually struggling and shuttering their brick and mortar locations, particularly fast fashion brands, for example, Forever 21 and H&M, really are struggling to maintain margins. So a lot of the growth that we see in apparel is being driven by explosive growth within activewear and athleisure. So that's one of the things that I'm going to dig into today, sort of trying to understand where we see that split happening and why consumers are sort of attracted to that particular type of apparel. So the agenda today I tried to make pretty simple. We've broken it out into eat, wear, and move, which hopefully are pretty self-explanatory, but um, if not, I promise you're going to figure it out pretty soon. So just to set the scene, um, the following audiences have really expanded quite a bit over the last three years. Um, when we tracked people who were interested in diets, such as gluten-free and paleo, and conducted searches for things such as chia seeds, flax seeds, kale, we see a 65% increase in the size of that audience um, since 2014. Um, and the move audience, which we define as people who are searching for gyms, for example, CrossFit, um, or seeking out fitness challenges like the Spartan Race or the Tough Mudder, 
We've seen a 12% increase in the size of that audience since 2014. And the wear audience has really exploded. So these are people who are seeking out and buying active wear like Lululemon or Athleta, um, or seeking to purchase wearables um, and fitness trackers, for example, Fitbit or Garmin. So to kick it off, we're going to look at EAT. Um, this is really focused on food and diet trends. Um, as consumer interest in healthy eating really continues to grow, it becomes very important for brands to be able to distinguish between the more short-lived diet fads and the real growing nutrition movements that are going to continue to sort of permeate food culture. Um, I found that search data can be a really excellent way to do that and try and predict what's going to continue to grow over the following years. So in the beginning of this year, um, I wrote a piece for Food Business News uh, that used Hitwise data to break down different types of food trends. And this was meant to help people understand sort of the ebb and flow of how consumers express interest and engagement in different types of diets and foods. So the first type of trend that you see here is it's almost the golden nugget of food trends. It's what I like to call steady risers. Um, organic food is probably the most classic example of a steady riser because it's been growing in public awareness and accessibility for many decades. Um, but looking at a more recent example here, we can see that since 2014, searches for gluten-free have risen very steadily by 141% um, since May of 2014, and they really show no signs of slowing. Um, in fact, I re-polled this data in 2017, and I found gluten-free searches continued to rise and grow very steadily um, through June of this year. Um, you might also note a couple spikes in the beginning or tail end of each year. That's really common for um, holiday recipe searches and New Year's diet resolutions. Uh, speaking of New Year's and diet resolutions, detox is a great example of searches that rise and fall pretty consistently at the beginning of each year. Um, so detox generates very regular uh, cyclical interest from consumers who are, I'm assuming, seeking to sort of purge themselves of their gluttonous holiday eating and, you know, start fresh and reset in the new year. And we see that happening every single year. Um, and as you expect, the what I like to call the so last year diet trends really hit their peak in 2016. And you know, since then, they've either sort of flattened out or started to drop. Um, interestingly, several diets in the so last year category were focused on lowering the consumption of certain healthy, unhealthy ingredients, you know, for example, low sugar and low carb. Um, by the way, I recharted these through June 3rd of this year, and I saw a continued decline in all three of these, particularly in the low sugar searches. Um, you know, and it's worth noting, it doesn't mean that these food trends are dead in the water or they're, they're gone. Um, you know, although low carb and paleo really flattened out in 2016, that was after they shot up very dramatically. So they still pull quite a bit of interest from people. Um, I think that so last year trends just kind of serve as this reminder that sudden and fast rising food trends can carry the risk of falling out of favor just as quickly. So it's something to be aware of when you see um, something shoot up that, that rapidly. Um, these are examples of what I like to call rising stars. Um, so these are food trends that show a sudden upswing in interest. Um, they showed an interest, upswing in interest in the end of 2016. Um, which at the time that I wrote this really suggested an opportunity for food providers to jump on. Um, I was surprised by the sudden interest in veganism and vegetarianism, uh, considering that both of those diets have existed for decades. Uh, but I think the resurgence could be attributed to, you know, a convergence of many different factors. For example, wider availability of vegan and vegetarian food, greater variety and quality, um, more restaurants available. Um, increase in news about meat-borne illnesses or viruses, and also just slowly rising environmental concerns. Um, I will note, though, that when I pulled the reports again this year, vegan and vegetarian searches, um, those jumps that we saw did appear to be short-lived since they dipped back down to their original numbers of the last couple months. So I guess that, that sort of moves them back into the so last year category, but, you know, uh, for 2017. Um, the biggest rising star that I identified of this year has been the ketogenic diet, 
which nearly doubled in searches in the beginning of 2017. So I'm going to kind of dive a little deeper into that just because I think it's a really interesting case study. Um, so if you look at the top three downstream websites, um, which just means those that are receiving the most clicks from ketogenic searches, um, we see Wikipedia and YouTube, which are, are pretty common for, you know, especially newer diets that are on the rise, people want to understand what they are. Um, also, YouTube influencers are really common in the food space, so they tend to pull a lot of traffic. Um, but one I wanted to call out was the diet doctor. Um, they, he pulls 14% um, of all ketogenic searches, and as you can see um, in the example on the bottom left, he, uh, um, he actually ranks number one for the search ketogenic diet. Um, it's all through just organic traffic. So what he was able to do over the last few years was create this sort of breadth of content on what he saw as a diet trend that he believed would emerge in coming years. And so as soon as that, that trend hit, and you can see on the top right the amount of organic clicks that were driving clicks, the amount of organic searches that were driving clicks over to um, all websites across different industries from ketogenic searches shot up in the beginning of 2017. And the diet doctor, as you can see on the bottom right, um, his visits to his website shot up in a corresponding way. So he was really able to capitalize on that by having this really wide breadth of in-depth content on the ketogenic diet. Um, I created an audience profile based on consumers who were searching for keto and ketogenic diet terms. Uh, demographically, they skew towards age 35 to 44, um, which a lot of diet trends either skew in that age or towards older millennials. Um, and although all diet searchers always skew female every single time, um, ketogenic searchers are slightly more male than other diets that I saw. Um, and in terms of their attitudes, if we look at food attitudes for ketogenic audiences, uh, they tend to seek more culinary adventure and variety and creativity um, in their food consumption. Uh, and just for reference, uh, when it says plus 30 on the top right, that, that means that they're 30% more likely than average to agree with that statement. Uh, and if you look on the bottom right, when it comes to health attitudes, we see amongst ketogenic dieters um, a vested interest in self-researching and self-diagnosing their own health issues. And they have a really strong willingness to take health counsel from their friends, perhaps even over their doctors, which I think is really interesting. Um, and finally, although we haven't really caught up with countries like Australia and the UK when it comes to online grocery delivery, we have seen a rise in home chef services and healthy snack food delivery to people's homes. So I wanted to do a quick chart to analyze that. Um, in the chart above, you can, you can see that compared to, uh, when we compare the top eight players in this space by charting their share of website visits within the grocery and alcohol industry, you can see how it's remained pretty tightly competitive amongst all eight of them. Um, and although the competition remains fierce as of right now um, and within the last year or so, Blue Apron has really managed to maintain a market lead. Um, and you can see major spikes in the beginning of 2017 that kind of dramatically drove up visit share for the top three players, Blue Apron, Home Chef, and HelloFresh. Um, but we also see healthy snack delivery services like Gray's and NatureBox kind of steadily losing visit share, which I think is interesting and I'm definitely curious to keep an eye on to see whether they're able to sort of maintain interest as, as food delivery uh, continues to rise in popularity. So moving on to the wear section, um, I'm going to be exploring trends around active wear and athleisure, uh, looking at different types of sport and fitness apparel um, as well as different products and then wearables um, such as fitness trackers. So just in a broader sense, um, when it comes to active wear terms, we see a 291% jump in search clicks since May of 2014. So with, with search clicks, search clicks I'm referring to the amount of searches that resulted in clicks to websites. So we see a lot of people clicking through to websites to seek out and purchase active wear. Um, and we see a, an even more meteoric rise amongst, amongst fitness trackers. Um, when it comes to fitness tracker search variations, when we bundled those in a portfolio, um, I, I tracked a 712% jump in search clicks. Um, so search, searches basically drive in clicks over to websites. Um, 
when they come from fitness track variation searches. So I think you can see a major area of growth in both of these. Uh, so in order to get a sense from for some of the rising organic search terms that are really driving a lot of this traffic to sportswear and activewear industry websites, um, I pulled and charted the top 10 unbranded search terms that are driving traffic to Nike.com because you know they're the biggest sports apparel brand in the country. Um, and by unbranded, I, I just mean that they don't include a brand name like Nike or the name of a particular shoe like Jordan. Um, and that suggests that other activewear brands could conceivably compete for this term organically as it, as it rises. So you can see here that there are several keywords that either emerged or shot up in 2017, such as custom shoes, um, half marathon training, women's track spikes, uh, comfortable men's boots, boots, and best casual shoes for men. Now, if we look at uh, Lululemon, which is sort of the industry magnate when it comes to athleisure apparel and sort of defines that as a brand, I did the same thing where I pulled the top 10 unbranded search terms that were driving traffic to their website, and I charted those over the past 52 weeks. So you can see that searches for yoga pants, which is sort of their steadiest staple product, do remain popular, but it actually no longer drives the lion's share of their clicks. Um, instead, we see more recent jumps in search clicks for things like sports bras um, and smaller increases in searches for running tights, meditation clothing, and even khaki, which I found pretty surprising, actually. <clears throat> so as an aside, I just wanted to take a quick look at yoga-related searches because I think yoga as a movement is really credited as a key driver for creating the athleisure movement and spinning off quite a bit of products. Um, and it sort of helps indicate the types of new products that activewear consumers are really searching for. So um, variations of the term yoga, when we bundled all of those together, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, have grown um, over the last three years at 81%. Uh, but that being said, the, the top searches um, that we see under yoga, such as yoga poses and just yoga itself, are actually losing search share as the mainstream culture becomes more familiar with what yoga actually is. Uh, yoga pants, which is the second highest variation of the term yoga, and probably you know the most famous one that we all think of when we think of yoga apparel, has also lost search share since 2014, as other search terms have begun to overtake share. So as you can see on the right, I actually removed yoga pants just because I think it takes, it takes a large percentage of the unbranded searches around yoga, and I wanted to help identify for you some other interesting terms that are rising in the yoga space. Um, for example, the more general search term yoga clothing shot up in the beginning of this year, and we're seeing a resurgence in searches for yoga mats even after Christmas, meaning a lot of people are looking to buy those for themselves. Um, and there's also bumps in smaller terms, such as yoga socks and yoga trapeze. So I think there's just there's a lot of interesting little products that are worth keeping an eye on that are emerging in this space. <clears throat> so back to Lululemon, um, I wanted to just take a closer look at their audience, since I feel like the Lululemon audience represents this almost magical dream of a customer base, because they're willing to spend a lot of money on activewear, and they're extremely loyal to this brand. So, the Lululemon audience is very fashion forward, they are image conscious, they enjoy makeup, and they care very deeply about purchasing very specific brands, which does help explain why they're willing to purchase you know, Lululemon products when Target and Gap and other brands sell their own athleisure clothing lines at a lower price point. Um, the largest segment of Lululemon consumers are older millennials, although uh, Gen X is the most over-indexed age group, which just means they are the most engaged age group. And that, that doesn't surprise me considering, you know, the price point of um, Lululemon clothing. So Lululemon's audience is one thing, and I know everybody wishes that they could get, you know, capture them. But I, I wanted to take a deeper look into the broader athleisure audience. So these are people who search for or interested in or buy Lululemon, Athleta, Fabletics, or smaller brands in the U.S. like Prana or Sweaty Betty. And um, I'm focusing specifically on millennials just because it helps narrow the audience. And also this is by far the largest audience for activewear um, and also really represents the next generation of athleisure consumers that everybody would try to understand. 
So the first thing that I wanted to call out, which I think is really important, is although athleisure is usually associated with women, um, the active wear audience is only 60% female. So that means 40% of this segment is actually men. And in case you're wondering, the segment does not include traditional sports apparel brands like Nike or Under Armour. The, these are men who are searching for Athleta and Lululemon. And so that sort of suggests that there's um, an untapped opportunity for active wear brands to really better understand this audience. And we can see Lululemon and some of the major brands trying to do that and fighting for that market share to an extent. But I personally haven't seen a clear winner amongst the male athleisure audience. So definitely something worth looking out for. Um, unsurprisingly, this audience does skew wealthily. So, wealthily, so the most over-indexed income group is consumers who make $100,000 a year or more. Um, and then older millennials reign supreme amongst millennials just because due to the nature of the fact that they're wealthy shoppers, it makes sense that they tend to skew a little bit older. <clears throat> if we look at mobile behavior, um, it's perhaps not very surprising because most millennial consumers are highly mobile. Um, but millennial activewear shoppers um, really rely pretty heavily on their phones to seek out deals and discounts. Um, and I found that in, they do that both in-store and out. So I think optimizing um, deal and discount offers really for mobile and focusing very heavily on that is, is extremely key. Um, and this audience is willing to spend you know, not only the money that they have, but more than they really should on the clothing that they want. Um, and I feel like this just serves to highlight that penny pinching and student loan debt um, and economic doubt are really less likely to be a factor for this audience in particular when it comes to them purchase, purchasing the apparel that they really desire. And this might be a little bit more surprising. Um, millennial activewear shoppers really enjoy spending long periods of time browsing in a store. Um, I think we often think about millennials as sort of the now and on-demand generation um, who are moving their purchases online and expect 24-hour delivery. Um, but there still appears to be quite a lot of value for them in, you know, having an experience of browsing and lingering and even sort of fawning over the next pair of yoga pants that they want to purchase. Um, and in that way, I think we could see how Lululemon's brick and mortar expansion, which, you know, could be considered risky in light of so many retail stores struggling and closing down, is really just creating this environment where people can browse and build desire for additional products that they want to buy. Um, and, and of course, you know, social media is a huge part of that. Um, millennial activewear shoppers are more likely to purchase products that are advertised on social media, and especially those that are used or recommended by friends on social media. So this is obviously important to keep in mind, not only for focusing on and optimizing social media advertising, but really for creating mechanisms for them to share and, and promote their purchases and their engagement with your brand with their friends on social media, even more so than you know, focus, that advertising focus. So just in the vein of social media, um, you know, this post on the left um, from Lululemon, I think is just, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty stereotypical Lululemon post in that it's got a striking photo, a strong caption. Um, it tags an Instagram influencer in order to increase discoverability. Um, and I think it, it really sells a lifestyle rather than a product. You know, we're not seeing the Lululemon logo incorporated here. It's really more about what this image represents. Um, it also includes their proprietary hashtag, the sweat life, which, you know, I think in, in a way it sort of encapsulates what Lululemon does extremely well, but what I think a lot of brands can do themselves. You don't have to be a Lululemon to do that. But what they really do is they focus on the quality of their posts rather than quantity. Um, they've focused a lot on building up their hashtag, the sweat life, which it was a really a thoughtful hashtag in that it's very universal, relatable, it's a really shareable um, hashtag, but people do mentally associate it with Lululemon. They leverage influencers, which is not something exclusive to big brands. You know, that can be done on a smaller or local scale by smaller brands who want to cultivate and build a following. And, you know, they have a Facebook page for every single Lululemon location, which is very actively managed and monitored. And that sort of becomes a, a bulletin board for the local community to share yoga classes and for people to talk about fitness events and really connect with each other. So finally, one other thing about millennial activewear shoppers, 
Um, I broke down some of the key uh, brand affinities they had across retail and media. Nordstrom is extremely engaging for them because they do sell quite a bit of athleisure clothing. And perhaps a lot of the um, publications aren't particularly surprising, like Bud BuzzFeed and Huffington Post, but I thought it was interesting to share how strongly they engage with those websites. And now moving from apparel over to wearables and fitness trackers, um, we saw a 245% increase in searches for fitness tracking devices since 2014, so after the last three years. Um, and according to CCS Insight, the wearables market will be worth upwards of $25 billion by 2019. Um, smartwatches will likely um, capture a lot of that market just to, due to the higher price, but fitness trackers definitely remain the most accessible and popular. So um, I wanted to spotlight Fitbit for a moment just because, you know, not everyone can be Fitbit, but I think they are this really great representation of how rapidly fitness-based technologies can just explode into the mainstream because we can all remember a time when no one had a Fitbit or could even imagine wearing one, and now everybody got one for Christmas, you know? So their audience is predominantly female, um, with 35 to 44-year-olds dominating that demand. Um, it could be because of mothers purchasing Christmas gifts, just as a caveat. Um, but I think Fitbit consumers really reflect a more middle-of-the-road retail consumer. Um, they over-index for engagement with affordable, everyday brands like Kohl's and Old Navy. So if you contrast that with something like the Lululemon audience, who is also female, but we see that the Fitbit audience is much more representative of almost this everyday American, um, rather than sort of the elites and wealthy people who are purchasing Lululemon products. And one aside before we move on to our final section, um, because meditation doesn't quite fit into eat, move, or wear, wear but it, it does have some important trends worth noting. Uh, you can see in this chart, there's quite a bit of growth in searches around meditation over the last three years. And I do think it's per a perfect example of a steady riser, which we talked about earlier. I, I predict based on sort of the steady growth that we see around variations of meditation searches that it's just gonna continue growth sta growing stably um, over the next several years. And you know, with that growth and in interest, inevitably comes efforts by businesses to monetize that. Um, I think meditation and mindfulness is in itself kind of a tricky thing to commoditize. Um, but we do see jumps in searches for products and services and technologies which can really assist consumers in improving their personal meditation practice. Um, most notably, of course, is searches around meditation apps like Calm and Mind Body and Headspace. So Headspace is a leading industry app that has been pushing mindfulness into other industries through really interesting partnerships. Uh, for example, they partnered with Virgin to supply in-flight relaxation, and they've been experimenting with um, integrating with retail by partnering with Selfridges, which is a big uh, retailer in the UK, to create experiences of in-store relaxation. So um, I think these inroads really represent the future of how different wellness movements and philosophies will kind of continue to permeate other industries and most likely affect how companies shape consumer experiences. Um, and one final thing, you can see rises in terms like meditation chair, cushion and pillows, and even meditation clothing um, as people kind of seek to continue supporting their meditation practice and just be comfortable while they do that. So um, final section is around move where we're gonna be looking at trends and audiences around gyms, workout methods, um, different fitness events and challenges, and spon sponsorships and partnerships that have branched out of that. So what I like to call the new fitness movement is really characterized by three key things. Um, a demand for greater variety and choice, um, a localized feel where you see a lot of boutique gyms cropping up and focused on community, and then a very social emphasis, which is where we see a lot of fitness-based events rising in popularity as well. So I'm gonna dive into all of those. So over the last three years, we see some of the sort of older types of classes and gyms remain steadily popular, but not attract quite as much search interest. So for example, Zumba's been around for a long time, and because of that, you know, the searches for it and people seeking it out has kind of 
worn down to 50, about 53 percent since 2014 just because a lot of people know what it is and they are seeking something new and greater novelty in, in their workouts. And full cycle might be surprising because they're really so you know, publicly visible, you probably have a soul cycle near you in your neighborhood. Um, there's no question that they're doing extremely well and they're very popular. I think a lot of people just know what soul cycle is. And so the novelty of, you know, soul cycle is slowly starting to wear off. So their searches are down 16%. Again, that doesn't mean they're failing. It's just um, people are always kind of seeking the next fitness challenge. And I think color runs are sort of this perfect example of something that back in 2014 um, were wildly popular. It was this sort of sudden fad um, and it was very event-based and social and it's beautiful and takes great pictures. So a lot of consumers we found really wanted to experience them once, you know, snap some Instagram pictures of it and then kind of move on to other experiences. So if we look at what consumers do seek out, it's really this constant drive for more novelty and variety in their um, workout routines. So class pass kind of perfectly encapsulates that because they sell passes to different gyms and exercise classes to um, their customers. And it really serves the needs that they have for, uh, you know, having greater choice in their workout options. Um, their searches have gone up 200% since 2014, and their website visits have shot up 1,125%, which is pretty um, incredible. Um, and on the right, you can see some of the sort of trending, you know, new types of fun and interesting workouts that people are interested in. For example, acro yoga, trapeze, and then, um, you know, rock climbing, which has grown quite a bit since May of 2014, which I found really interesting because, you know, rock climbing has been around for a long time. I think we're just seeing it having this new resurgence by people who are sort of discovering it or joining rock climbing gyms or seeing it as a way for them to you know, enjoy a new and creative type of fitness outside with friends. So it's had this really interesting resurgence over the last several years. Um, and one of the staples I mentioned as part of the new fitness movement is the focus on fitness as sort of a social community gathering. Um, so here I'm going to profile a couple different types of fitness events that we see doing extremely well and how those tie into media and other partnerships. One type of social fitness event we see are fitness challenges. So these are really based on pushing your body to the limit with a focus on, you know, endurance and strength and being hardcore. <laughs> um, and the picture you see here is from the Spartan race, which I feel like is a really good encapsulation of that. It's like six packs and, you know, machismo in, all in one picture. Um, so three popular types of fitness challenges include Tough Mudders, uh, Marathons, and Ironmans. And here you can see what, you know, on the surface might seem like very similar audiences. You know, people try, taking on fitness challenges, pushing the limits of their endurance are actually quite different. Um, although their age... Uh, Siri wants to join the conversation. <laughs> um, although their ages and their gender breakdown is um, pretty similar, uh, we can see based on where they go online that they're actually quite different audiences. So Ironman enthusiasts are really over-indexing for gaming and entertainment-focused websites like 4chan and Twitch, whereas, you know, a marathoner is someone who's interested in business and finance content like USA Today, Yahoo Finance, and BBC. Um, so I thought it was a really way to interesting way to highlight what seems like very similar audiences and how different their behaviors are and how you might reach them in very different places online. Yeah, you know, and when it comes to pushing the limits of endurance, of course, there's no way I can leave out CrossFit. Um, I think some of the key elements of what makes CrossFit successful is, you know, a few things. One, this idea of pushing the limits of your own endurance and strength. Um, it's extremely social and team-based, um, and the box gyms really create a local feel because each of them kind of has their own workout method and approach. Um, and in terms of their audiences, Considering the focus is on weightlifting and strength, it's interesting to note there are more women engaged with CrossFit online than men. Um, and CrossFit fans are more likely to seek out organic foods, um, eat, seek environmentally friendly products, um, and they also tend to agree with statements that reflect um, early technology adoption, which I found interesting. Now, the CrossFit Games are this really great example of how CrossFit was able to expand into a national brand thanks in part to a series of strategic cross-industry partnerships. 
So on the retail side, a lot of marketers argued that a brand like Reebok, you know, who was really waning in relevance a decade ago, was able to revitalize their brand by sponsoring the CrossFit Games. And meanwhile, you know, Reebok's infusion of, you know, prize money capital allowed CrossFit to, you know, boost the stakes of their games by offering millions of dollars in prize money. So this suddenly pulled a lot more participation. There were much fiercer displays of athleticism, and that was able to draw the attention of media moguls like ESPN to start live streaming the games. So that strategic partnership really created a cascade of opportunity for both of those brands. And CrossFit had started out just as a workout method in a few local gyms and was able to propel themselves onto this sort of national stage through the use of the games and also a partnership with a retailer. Um, the other type of social fitness event that we see doing extremely well are wellness events. So these are more about, you know, group fitness as a way to connect, you know, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And, you know, the reflection of this that you can see on a smaller scale is really around growth in yoga retreats. I found search variations for yoga retreat had shot up 1,171% over the last three years. Um, but on a larger scale, we also see these events and music festivals that are incorporating, you know, wellness and a yoga focus. For example, Lightning in a Bottle or in the picture that you see here, Wanderlust. And I'm actually going to spotlight Wanderlust because they're a really interesting example of almost this new proto-wellness brand that exists across multiple industries and is really unified by a culture more than it is by one single product, event, or, you know, piece of media. So they do sell clothing. They host music festivals all over the world. They have a variety of media and video channels, which are all extremely successful. But, you know, the versatility of this brand allows them to create a variety of partnerships that enables them to sort of transcend a single industry and really expand across multiple markets. So it's almost limitless. Um, and when you have a brand like this, you can see why they met immediate success in their partnership with Adidas. So um, they recently released a Wanderlust, Wanderlust clothing line on Adidas' website, and it really exploded in interest. You can see the date it was released, it pretty much shot up in searches um, immediately. And part of the reason it's able to pull that kind of success is because Wanderlust is more than a brand. You know, it's, it's a way of life. Um, and this is a common thread that we see through a lot of successful health and wellness brands and that I've talked about quite a bit with some of the examples before. The successful brands are the ones that are able to transcend the product or service itself and become or even help define, you know, what the wellness movement and culture is. So just to wrap things up, um, three key takeaways. Uh, one is marketing to trends over fads. The fact is we see explosive growth across many industries when it comes to health and wellness, and so it's easy to get distracted. And the key is really to be able to identify and capitalize on trends rather than short-lived fads. So it's important to understand and identify cyclical patterns and to be wary and look out for fast risers, which could be short-lived. And also keep an eye out for those emerging and steady movements, which may transform the industry over time. Um, the way that the diet doctor did with the ketogenic diet, you can see how getting ahead of those and investing in them early can pay off and be incredibly valuable. Um, second, the health movement is defined by, you know, novelty, change, and variety. So if it's creative workout classes or seasonal demand for new activewear styles or easy ways, you know, that are new and fun to cook at home or even just the rise and fall of new diet trends, uh, you can see how, for the most part, consumers don't see their health journey as a stagnant one. Um, they're constantly modifying and tweaking their approach to personal wellness. So for brands to succeed in that such a competitive and fast-moving space, they have to kind of continually push the limits of what they offer and experiment with creative partnerships and really look for innovative ways to support new health movements as they emerge because they will constantly be shifting. Um, and finally, the health movement is about more than products or services. Consumers want to feel but also be seen as being connected and mindful and challenged and inspired and just holistically well. And their purchases should support and reflect both that internal and external need as an individual. 
So we find that the next generation of consumers are willing to spend a lot of money on products they believe will support their personal wellness, but also that they believe will reflect that side of themselves to other people. Um, so being perceived as healthy and fit and connected in itself is an extremely valuable social commodity for consumers. And whatever you can do as a brand to create, bolster, and amplify that identity for them, the better off that you'll be. So that's all. Thank you. Um, I think Daryl's going to help me pull up some questions. Um, yeah, uh, great job, Rochelle. Uh, incredible insights there with that presentation. Um, so a few questions have been coming in. Uh, one common one was, will uh, the PowerPoint and the recording be available after the presentation? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, we will be sending out via email to all the uh, registrants. Uh, the slides as well as a recorded version of this uh, presentation. So let's look through the questions, see if there's right, any here. We can identify one. Um, all right, so one person was asking about ways that, you know, smaller brands, especially, you know, small, let's say a small active or apparel brand, um, can really build up and amplify presences and learn from, you know, a bigger brand like Lululemon, which I think is a great question. So. One of the examples that I, you know, highlighted was, for example, that, that Instagram post that I shared from Lululemon. Um, even if as a smaller brand you don't have the same amount of followers or engagement, there are a lot of ways that you can um, mimic some of the methods that they're using and, you know, take them in and use them for yourself. So even if you're unable to connect with, you know, a massive influencer or a celebrity, on a local level, really focusing on localized issues, you can probably identify people who matter to a community, and start building relationships there. See if you can support them on social media and vice versa. Ways to, that you can do that is also giving away samples of their clothing and encouraging people to share. They also built out and really invested a lot of time on creating their own proprietary hashtag, one that didn't represent their clothing or product, but represented an identity and a culture. So, you know, the whole idea of finding your tribe, I think with health and wellness in particular, that's, that's everything. It's not about the products. It's about people feeling connected and showing other people, you know, who they are. So. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I think we may have time for one more. I just remembered that um, there may be a fire drill here, <laughs> so we might have to exit. <laughs> so uh, I think we may have time for one more. All right. Um, let's take a look and see. Um, have there been any interesting trends around supplements like vitamins? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, as part of this presentation today, because I was trying to keep it short, I didn't dive into the vitamin space. That being said, I do have, um, I've got some searches around superfoods and omega-3s and that kind of stuff that I didn't have time to get to in this presentation. Um, and also, if you, um, I've actually got anyone who asked a question, I've got your name and email, and I, I can re I'll reach out to you individually and see if there's anything that I can, any research that I can provide for you. I'm more than happy to do that. So if anyone has any questions that I didn't get to like that, um, and you drop that in here, I'll make sure to reach out to you and um, give you some final thoughts on that. Got it, got it, absolutely. Well, with that, I think we should wrap up. Thanks again, Rochelle, for the presentation, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And Thanks, uh, everybody. Have a great day. Have a great day. Bye-bye.